Hello friends. So I'll be giving a snippet talks. Uh, maybe for next over one to two months, I will cover quite a few of these uh, small little snippets, which will be of practical relevance uh, in day-to-day -day management of certain key conditions in ICU. Uh, so cardiogenic shock is something which we commonly see in, in ICU and acute decompensated heart failure is another commoner one. So I, maybe next four to five minutes because snippets I would want to confine the narratives to maybe four to five minutes, not more than that. So that's the context I'll be doing over next maybe two months till June. Uh, so I, uh, today when we ask our trainees, give me the outline of cardiogenic shock, we need to have some sort of a template on which we answer these questions. And even ADHF, if I ask one, any of our trainees, how do you approach? We need to have some templating as to how we package the answer. So I'll just take you through that so that it will be useful for your exams. So when you talk about cardiogenic shock management, I won't go into the detailing of each and every aspect, just give you a little bit of a framework and outline. So we have to put it into three major categories. As I tell all my trainees, when you answer, put it in a pyramid approach, Start broad, then build up your answers and go to specific. So when uh, when you ask cardiogenic shock, I would put it into three categories. And uh, one is the management of etiology. The second one, which is more pertinent to our ICU, is optimization of hemodynamics. And any cardiogenic shock would lead to other organ dysfunction, managing other organs. So this would be the three main categories. Because unless we treat the underlying cause, we may not be able to address the shock. So what are the key etiological management. So just put it figuratively. So the most commonest cause would be ACS. So of course, when there is ACS, you have to apply the principles of ACS, involve cardiologists, percutaneous intervention of some sort has to be done. Or it can be arrhythmias. It can be AF or SVTs, VT, so on and so forth, which leads to cardiogenic shock. So we have to address arrhythmias. Or you may have a hypertensive problem, which would lead to heart failure and cardiogenic shock. And the fourth one is whether they have any Valvular lesions, it could be severe mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, or worsening of the septal defects. So these are some things where you have to fix the problem to fix the, to address the shock. So etiology comes into four categories, coronary, arrhythmias, hypertension, and valvular problems. So for intensivists, the one that becomes important is how do we optimize hemodynamics? When you say optimize hemodynamics, there are two broad categories. One is to improve the perfusion because cardiogenic shock, the whole perfusion is impaired. We have to improve the perfusion. The second aspect is to improve the cardiac contractility. So we know. So when we answer, so we have to put this in this sort of a package. So how do we improve perfusion? Again, you have to divide into three categories. One is to increase, you have to address a situation where preload is high. You have to reduce or if preload is low, you have to optimizing the preload is something you have to do. And if they have hypotension, obviously we have to address the hypotension with vasopressors or inotropes and treat the underlying cause. So how do we increase preload or optimize preload rather? So if preload is low, you have to give maybe small allocate of fluid. Generally in cardiogenic shock with a cardiac dysfunction, preload is assumed to be higher. So you have to do your volume status assessment and give diuretics if needs be. And if diuretics do not suffice to sort of optimize the preload. So there may be situations where you may have to put them on renal replacement therapy to take away all the excess fluid, especially if you have a situation with a right heart failure. So we may have a lot of fluid accumulation and we may have to do scuff or uh, um, you know some sort of a renal replacement therapy to remove all that excess fluid. So when there is hypotension, obviously we have to initiate vasopressors and always, always, always the choice is norepinephrine once patient is you only make and you have attained reasonable blood pressure, you may have to consider dobutamine as an inotrope or mindrinone or levosimendone to improve the cardiac contractility and to reduce the afterload. And treatment of underlying cause because many a times cardiogenic shock, if coronaries are normal, there can be vasoplegic situation or sepsis induced myocardial dysfunction leading to cardiogenic shock is also something we see. So we have to treat the underlying cause. I think that also becomes terribly important. And other organ dysfunction, invariably cardiogenic shock, if they have a uh, sort of increased preload with a fluid overload, NIV is a very good tool to improve oxygenation, to reduce the afterload, to reduce the work of breathing, recruitment of alveoli, and, uh, and addressing the pulmonary edema. So it has a multimodal effect. And if there is acute kidney injury or cardiorenal syndrome, they may have to be uh, started on dialysis sooner than later. 
and some sort of a sedation has to be put in place to temper the whole sympathetic overactivity that these patients may tend to have. So this is in broad the sort of a categorization of approach or the framework of how we approach cardiogenic shock. And this is something which is taken from the 2025 uh, sort of a review article on cardiogenic shock. So this is not something I have created, although I have tried to put it in a little simplistic way. And uh, so we spoke about etiological management. We spoke about optimizing hemodynamics, improving perfusion, preload, cut pressure, and underlying. So I have not addressed the cardiac contractility. So for that, we have to look at heart as both chambers. So you have to optimize LV and you have to optimize RV and both are interdependent. So when you are addressing RV, we cannot forget LV. When we are optimizing LV, we cannot forget RV. So both are interdependent. So in RV, so obviously you have to look at uh, RV filling pressures because RV is very volume dependent. So you have to use your uh, sort of dynamic fluid responsive test and other sort of a strategies to assess the volume. And if uh, RV filling is inadequate, you may have to give small allocards. And if RV afterload is high, there is a separate video I have done only to see how you reduce the RV afterload. I'll tell you very briefly, if RV afterload is more, you have to, RV is dependent on LV. You have to improve LV function and take measures to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. And I told you about the categorization in the previous video, how we reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. We have various drugs. You have phosphodiesterase inhibitors, endothelin receptor inhibitors, and then we most importantly prevent hypoxemia, oxygen, and we have to reduce the intrathoracic pressure by reducing the PEEP because that will worsen the RV strain. So some of the measures you can refer to that video as to the measures you'll put in place to reduce RV afterload. How about LV? If LV filling pressures is low, of course, you have to give a small allocates of fluid. And if there is increased LV afterload, so you may have to consider using dobutamine, which reduces the LV afterload. Most importantly, like I said, in reducing afterload, any arrhythmias has to be mitigated, has to be treated aggressively, and we have to prevent any sort of supraventricular or ventricular arrhythmias, because that can worsen both failures, RV or LV. And always, always, always put your mind on reducing the tachycardia aspect with beta blockers, which I said in measures that you put in place to reduce RV afterload also. And in extreme situations, you may have to put them on balloon pump to support the LV. If all these measures are inadequate, you have to move to the mechanical circulatory support. There is an algorithm for that. Maybe in the next snippet, I'll talk about the algorithm for mechanical support devices. What are the choices, which I made a mention in the RV afterload uh, in the previous video. So this is our approach. So any cardiogenic shock for a trainee, if someone asks, you have to categorize it, etiological management, then you have to contractility, you have to talk about preload management, and other organ dysfunction support, and so on and so forth. And when we talk about uh, sort of a ADHF, so we'll move from, see, cardiogenic shock, there is an overlap. When I say shock, there is a blood pressure issue, flow issue. But there are many a times the precipitating or the preceding factor is ADHF, acute decompensated heart failure. So if you have acute decompensated heart failure with accelerated hypertension with MR and ER, so we have to put in measures mainly to reduce afterload. So in these situations where blood pressure is very high, sodium nitroprusside is something that we can consider at 5 to 10 micrograms per minute, titrated to the effort. Maximum dose is up to 400 micrograms per minute. And if there is lung congestion, obviously you have to reduce preload. NTG can be used at 5 to 10 micrograms, titrated every 3 to 5 minutes, maximum up to 200 micrograms per minute. If patient has a non-systolic heart failure where there is systolic dysfunction, dobutamine can be considered plus or minus balloon pump. If there is a no diastolic heart failure, beta blockers plus or minus vasopressors, but when there is a diastolic heart failure, make sure you try to avoid inotropes or sodium nitroprusside because this can worsen diastolic heart failure. So this is in a situation where there is decompensation of heart failure has happened with a sort of a higher blood pressure and lung congestion. So this is the sort of a framework that you could adopt. Because many a times it's an ADHF which tends to perpetuate and worsen and then lead on to cardiogenic shock. And ADHF, there is this nice sort of a pictorial representation of the main pillars of management. So there are four main pillars. One is the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, beta blockers to correct the heart rate, and SGLT2 inhibitors, which is sodium glucose transporter inhibitors and angiotensin receptor neprolysin. So these constitute the four key pillars of management. Once patients are stabilized in ICU from the acute crisis, these are the drugs you may have to put in place for ADHF. 
And in addition to this, if these patients have tachyarrhythmias or atrial fibrillation, then anticoagulation has to be thought. Or even digoxin also should be thought of to control the AF and to control the rhythm and the rate. Or cardiac resynchronization therapy has to be put in place. And if it's sinus tachycardia, evabradin could be considered along with these four pillars in ADHF. If there is obviously a lung congestion, do pyritics and thiazides. And in advanced heart failure, certain pulmonary vasodilators like Versigot or Omicamtiv or even RV support devices, mechanical RV support devices should be thought of. And these patients with advanced heart failure should be listed for cardiac transplantation. And if there is associated valvular defects, then you have to subject them to some sort of a surgical intervention to correct this valvular regurgitations or valvular problems that they may have. And LTG has to be thought of or hydralazin could be thought of. If RNEs are expensive, the cost effective way or alternative to that is AC inhibitors or ARB. And if these heart failure patients have low iron, uh, uh, iron deficiency anemia with low ferritin or transferrin saturation less than 20, they have to be replenished with ferric carboxy maltase. So this is just a pictorial representation of all the dimensions of heart failure management that you should keep in mind especially after the acute crisis is settled, where I showed you the algorithm for acute crisis. After that is settled, you may have to think of these oral drugs for your ADHF in ICU. And I have created a, just a mnemonic to make it easy for trainees. Any patients with cardiac conditions, think of ABCDNS, A to the power of 3. A is you will give antiplatelets of some nature, aspirin, ticagrelor, which I will be talking about. And you have to give MRA, mineralocorticoid receptor, aldactone, epilaranone or AC inhibitors, or RNEs, or ARB, angiotensin. So, so these are the three sort of a things that you could think of in any patients with cardiac condition. B is beta blockers. C, I put a trade name. It's anticoagulation, clexane. D is diuretics. N is nitrates. S is statins and SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is just a mnemonic for you to recall so that we don't miss out on all the key drugs that needs to be put in place in patients with any cardiac conditions, it may be one or two of these. I'm not telling you how to put all these things. At least think of this uh, mnemonic and see what all what all sort of a drugs need to be put in place to optimize their heart function. So thank you, friends. So request you all to submit your valuable work to a Journal of Acute Care, which comes out every three months. You can visit my website to rehear to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you.